tuning in today and watching our video archive or live stream, however you're getting it in your living room or wherever you may be around the world. We're so glad that you're watching today. and We hope that you're sensing the presence of God. We really desire to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're believing God to touch you in a very, very special way as you watch this video today. So may God's word touch your heart. And we just pray that after you're done watching that you would take time and look through our website and see what all we have to offer. And if you're ever in the Silver Spring area, we invite you to come and be a part of us in our sanctuary and our services. So may God bless you. We want to take you to a service right now. Be blessed. How's everybody doing this morning? Let's give God a hand this morning. Don't give me a hand. The presence of the Lord is in this place. My goodness, when they were singing that song, Do It Again. I don't know if I'm going to have much of a voice left to preach because, man, I was just singing that out because how many know sometimes we need God to do it again? You know, we go through some dry seasons in our lives, and it's not just those of you sitting out there. Those of us up here sometimes go through dry seasons too. Those of us who preach the Word of God go through dry seasons. My father-in-law, Pastor Mike, that you just saw up there on the screens, he, he would say from time to time, you know, in, in his sermon, some people think that I get beamed up to heaven after I'm done preaching. You know, and I'm just up there floating around with the angels. And then on, on Sunday morning, I get beamed back down to preach to you guys. And then I go right back up after the service is over. That's not how it works, folks. We go through stuff too. Are you hearing me this morning? Sometimes we need God to show up and do it again. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. We really need a move of God in our churches. You know, we really need the presence of God. We're fortunate here at Living Word to be able to experience the presence of God and at Life Source, it's the same thing. There's, you know, just such a free move and free reign of the Holy Spirit to come in and have His way, but not, not many churches are like that in this country and even throughout the world. So this morning I want to pray and I want to just dedicate this sermon to God and I have my notes, I have my outline, but I want to just ask Him to use me to speak however He wants to speak through me, amen, because I'm just a vessel. You know, anybody who stands up here, we're just vessels. We prepare and we, we, we really seek God to see what he's wanting to speak. But at the end of the day, he's the one who has to use us to speak because he knows what each person is going through in here. So, Father, in the name of Jesus today, God, I just dedicate myself to you once again as a vessel asking you, Holy Spirit, to use me in this moment to speak to your people. Father, remove every distraction from my mind today. Remove every hindrance, God, from this word going forth. If there's anything in me, O oh God, that is not in alignment with what you are wanting to do here this morning, I pray that you would align me, God. Move me however you want to move me, direct me however you want to direct me, and flow through me to minister to your people this morning. God, we give you this service, Holy Spirit. We say that you are the king of this house, Jesus. You are the king of this house. You sit on the throne of this house. So we give you all the power, all the dominion, and all the authority this morning in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Well, I'm going to just jump right into the Word of God today because I got quite a bit of ground that I want to cover with you, and I believe that this Word is going to be a benefit to many people here today because like I was saying, we go through dry seasons. And I want to just ask you this morning to be honest with me. How many of you would say you've been going through a little bit of a dry season here lately? I got my hand up. You know, I've preached here enough that you guys have kind of gotten to know me, and I've told you before, I like it when you say amen when I'm preaching, because it helps me know that you're not falling asleep on me, you're hearing what I'm saying, but this morning I want to tell you, whether you say amen or not, I'm going to say amen to myself, because I'm preaching to myself today, because I need this, I need this word, amen? So I want to talk to you today about the race that we're running. How many remember that sermon that I preached, Get Your Fight Back? That was my first sermon I ever preached here. This could be like a sequel to that sermon, a follow-up to that sermon. I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and, and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. How many know that's happening right now? But you will be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now let me pause right there. That's for all of us. Do the work of an evangelist. Well, you may say, that's not my gifting, that's not my anointing. We like to throw that word around a lot in church, don't we? I'm not anointed to do that. Can I tell you something? You're anointed to do whatever God tells you to do when you get up out of bed that day. And guess what? It may change from day to day. So don't get locked into what you're doing and saying, this is my ministry. It's not your ministry. You don't have a ministry. It's Jesus' ministry. And whatever he tells you to do, that's your ministry for the day. Amen? Amen, Pastor David. I told you, I'm going to say amen to myself today. But be watchful in all things, enduring afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Enduring afflictions. Nobody ever said this would be easy. We have it wrong if we think that as soon as we accept Jesus into our lives, everything's going to be hunky-dory and peachy. It says, enduring afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Well, how can I be an evangelist? Well, Easter's coming up. You can invite somebody. Look around you. There's some empty seats this morning. We need to treat, by the way, every Sunday like it's Resurrection Sunday because our King already resurrected. So every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. That's another sermon. Verse 6, for I am already being poured out. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I want you to zero in on that. I have finished the race because that's what we're talking about this morning. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. I want one of those crowns. What about you? So this morning we're talking about the race. You know, this, this faith, this faith walk that we walk, well, the faith race that we run, it's not always easy. He said right there, enduring afflictions. The apostle Paul was in prison multiple times. He was beaten. He was stoned and left for dead. He went through some afflictions. You know, and you may be going through some afflictions right now because as we run the race, there's ups and downs, there's hills, there's hurdles that we have to jump over. And so this morning, I want you to take a look at the screens as the video department prepares to play this video that I, that I pulled for you guys. I want you to take a look at these racers and some of the afflictions that they went through. Maybe you can relate to this this morning. Go ahead and play that video, guys. Enjoy the music, by the way. So true, so true. We all fall down sometimes, don't we? Did you know that it's okay to fall down? We all get knocked down. Life hands us stuff, the enemy hands us stuff. We get knocked down sometimes. We get depleted, we get discouraged. At times, maybe even we get depressed. It's okay to get knocked down. We're not perfect, we're humans. But it's time to get back up, amen? And so the title of my sermon this morning is Down But Not Out. 
down but not out. In the race, we get knocked down sometimes. And maybe if you'd be honest and you'd say, I'm knocked down right now. I've had the wind knocked out of me because of what life dealt me. You may be down, but that's all right because you can get back up. You're not out of the race. If you're under the sound of my voice this morning, if you're here in this room, you're not out. You're still in the race. You may be down, but this morning you're getting back up in Jesus' name. Amen? Maybe you're watching this live stream right now. You may be down, but you're not out. So that's what we want to talk about today. How do you get back up once you're down? I'm going to give you three steps this morning if you're taking notes. My first step, when you're down and you want to get back up, is you have to remember Remember, and I've preached this point quite a bit in in my sermons over the years because I think it's so pertinent and so important as a, a Christ follower to remember the things that he's brought us through. We need that. David is such a good example of that in the Bible. I think David's the best example of remembering what God had brought him through, the hardship, so that when hardships come your way, you can remember what God brought you through. Look at Psalm 103. Verses 1 through 5, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. We know this. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. See, sometimes you have to speak to your own soul. Sometimes you have to say whether your soul feels like it that day or not. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, even the parts that are achy this morning on Monday morning when I have to get out of the bed and go to work and I don't feel like it because I don't want to see those faces, right? Let's be real this morning. That's the time to get up and say, oh, it's a good day. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. But what happens when crisis strikes? What happens when calamity hits and everything's out of whack? Well, then you have to say, and forget not all of his benefits. See, he's already brought me through some stuff. Remember all of the things that he's brought me through. Who forgives all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with love and kindness and tender mercies, who who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Amen. How many received that word this morning? And see, David had an understanding of this. That's why when David was standing as a little boy in front of Goliath, and he saw him taunting the Israelites, he said to Saul, he can't do that. I'm going to go kill that Philistine. Now think about that for a moment. A young boy, and here's this gigantic assassin who's been trained to kill people. What was it inside of him that gave him the courage to say, doesn't matter, I'm going to kill this guy? Well, he tells Saul, he says, Saul tells him, you can't do that. This, you're just a youth, and this, this man is, has been a man of war from the time of his youth. How are you going to defeat him? And he said, just like God gave me victory over the lion when they came after my father's sheep, the bear that came after my father's sheep, just like God gave me the victory over all of those, he's going to give me the victory. See, you've got to be able to tap into some victories that God has given you. Some of us have forgotten where God has brought us from. Some of us have forgotten all of the faithfulness of God over the years in our lives. And so we're faced with this difficulty and we think, how could I possibly get through this? All the while God is saying, look what I already brought you through. You have to remember. Tap into those memories because the devil doesn't want you to remember what God has already done. He wants you to have spiritual amnesia so that you can't remember what God has brought you through. But you need those victories, see? You need those past victories for the future obstacles that are going to come your way. So we have to remember what God has brought us through for two reasons. Number one, because you need to tap into that. But number two, your children need to tap into the victories that God has given you over the years. Look with me at Joshua chapter 3, verse 9 through 17. It says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Now at this point, this is when Moses is out of the picture. Joshua is leading the children of Israel into battle. It says, and Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, all the sites. There's a lot of sites in the Bible. 
the Amorites, the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take for yourself 12 men of the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. The waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. Now, I want you to see something here. It says, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest touch the water, then the water will cease. Sometimes, you know, you've got to take that first step of faith. We're waiting on God to do a miracle, and God's waiting on us to take a step. Are you hearing me this morning? And sometimes you have to take a step of faith for something in the now that will affect something upstream a little later on. Because it says that the water ceased upstream. Are you hearing me this morning? Verse 14, so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark of the Covenant came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped to, into the edge of the water of the Jordan, which overflows the banks during that time, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still. Wow, think about that for a moment. Here's this overflowing river. It's not a little creek, by the way. This is an overflowing river. So the waters went down into the Sea of Abara, the, the Salt Sea, and failed and were cut off. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the story. I want to just paraphrase what happens because I'm a little low on time this morning. So the Bible says that God speaks to, to Joshua and tells him to take one man from each tribe of Israel and to go back after all the Israelites had crossed over to go back and take a stone from the Jordan River. Okay, think about this for a minute. It's dry now. They're able to walk back. Sometimes when God gives you a victory, you've got to be willing to go back to that place of victory and create a memorial. And so he says, go get a stone, each one of the men of the tribe of Israel. Get a stone and take it to the place where you're sleeping tonight and put together an altar, a memorial, a memorial of what God has done so that when your children ask you one day, what do those stones mean? You'll be able to tell them what God brought you through and how he caused the Jordan to dry up and bring you through. See, your children, listen to me this morning, we get so caught up and so agitated and so irritated with frustrations and the things that the life, that life dealt, deals us, right? But it's possible that what you're going through this morning, God wants to give you victory over that so that years down the road, your children can tap into that victory when they're going through a similar struggle. And maybe you don't have children. Maybe you're here today and you don't have children. Can I tell you something? You have spiritual children. There's a next generation that has to grab a hold of this or there will be no church. We have a mandate. We have a spiritual duty to impart this to the next generation if we want this place to have people in it in the next 60 years. So you have children. Whether God's given you physical children here in the natural realm or not, you have something that you need to impart to somebody, and they need your testimonies. Amen? So it's twofold. We remember what God has brought us through for the victories that we need to tap into that for ourselves, but then we also set up memorials and testimonies of what God has done in our lives. Amen? Secondly, we have to be unshakable. It's my second point this morning. We have to be unshakable. If we're going to get back up, see, we can get back up by remembering the things that God has done in our lives. But if we're going to run the race, we have to be unshakable. That means whatever life deals you, don't let it shake you. We've got it backwards because we let little situations shake us when we're the ones who have the power to shake our situations. One person grabbed a hold of that. <laughs> But pastor, you don't know what I'm going through this morning. Well, friend, you don't know what I'm going through this morning. If I'm going to live, if I'm going to preach this, I have to be able to live it too, right? I've told you before, I'm transparent. I'm not going to get up here and preach something that I'm not living. I'm too scared of God to do that. You know, there's some people that will get up and they'll preach certain things, but they're not willing to live it. I'm afraid of God. See, I learned fearing, fearing God, a healthy fear. This is sacred right here. This altar here, the, the delivery of the word, the preaching of the word of God, that's something sacred. I don't play around with that. If I'm not living the way that I'm supposed to live, then I'm not going to be up here preaching. I can find another profession. Are you hearing me this morning? 
But we go through some things. Just because I, I'm believing God to bring me through something doesn't mean that we don't go through stuff. I'm going through something right now where I'm having to believe God. I'm going to share this with you to encourage your faith, to let you know that we're in this together. A couple weeks ago, I had an injury. Some of you have heard about it. I had several people come up, ask me, how are you doing? I'm doing much better. I'm believing God for total healing. But I had an injury in which I sustained a severe concussion. I got, I mean, I got hit hard on the head. And I thought, well, you know, I've gotten hit harder than that over the years. I'm fine. And so a few hours later, I'm having lunch and I start falling asleep while I'm sitting. Oh, oh, I told my wife, we probably need to go to the hospital. So I went and got checked out. Sure enough, because of the hit on the head, I had a severe concussion. And so they scheduled me with a neurologist. They said, you need to follow up and, you know, we need to do some tests and so forth. And so the neurologist checked me out and he said, you know what? He said, it's possible that what you're experiencing, because my eyes weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Like when, when I was following his finger, you know, my eyes, he would say, follow my finger. I said, they, I can't, I physically can't. He said, keep your, finger, keep your eyes right here on my finger. My eyes kept going back to the middle. And he said, well, it's possible that the concussion aggravated this, but I think this may be from a pre-existing condition with your brain. How many know that if you are not rooted and grounded in your faith, that's something that can cause you to get knocked down? And he even told me the term of whatever the illness was, and I didn't even write it down. I don't even remember what it was because it kind of just went in one ear and out the other. Listen, we have a lot of doctors in our church. I'm sure there are many doctors here in this congregation. We love you. We appreciate you. I'm not trying to discredit what you're doing, but if you're here this morning, that's because you believe in a supernatural God too. Amen. If you're here this morning, that's because you believe in a God that can do miracles. And so when they told me, when he told me this, he said, you know, it's probably from a pre-existing condition. We need to do an MRI of your brain. How many have ever been in an MRI machine, by the way? Man, a lot of people I thought it was just me, but a lot of people just raised their hands. And so I get into this MRI machine, and she says, it's going to be 20 minutes. I said, what? I thought it was just like a little x-ray, you know what I mean? And I'd be right out. Anybody who knows me well, I've got my cousins here this morning, everybody. Can we put our hands together for my cousins, Joe and Jesse? These guys are awesome. They know me really well because, see, we grew up together. So they know me pretty good. My wife's right there. She knows me pretty good. I cannot do anything for 20 minutes straight. So when I was told, you're going to lay in this thing, we're going to put your head in this vice, and we're going to put these earplugs in, these big ear muffs on you, you're going to lay there for 20 minutes, keep your eyes closed. I said, you can forget that. My eyes are going to be open the whole time. And then, it's like the loudest, like an old fax machine. I'm getting off track this morning, but I'm in this MRI machine the whole time. See, when I walked out, I said, God, verbally, like I'm talking to you right now, audibly, I said, God, if you have a work for me to do, then I have to believe you're going to take care of this. See, we've got to get to a place in our faith where we, we're not worried about it. We're not worried about it. To die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. That's what the Apostle Paul said. So guess what? Look, I believe with all my heart that God has a work for me to do. If not, I could have died a long time ago because Lord knows I've done some stupid stuff. I had motorcycles. I did all kinds of dumb stuff as a teenager. So I could have died a long time ago. If I'm still alive, I believe God's got a work for me to do. But if he decides to take me home one day, why are we afraid of that? You know, when, when, when I've been in planes and, and I've traveled, you know, overseas sometimes to Africa, to Europe, when you're in the middle of the ocean at 30,000 feet up and the plane starts shaking and it's going all crazy, you know, it's, it's, I know it's easier said than done. But if we truly know where we stand with God, there should be no anxiety there. There should be no worry there because, God, I know you have a work for me to do, so I know nothing's going to happen with this plane. But in, in the event that it did, I'll see, my, I'll see my Savior. That's what we are living for is to one day be able to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? So there should be no anxiety. But let me, let me just tell you, I'm going to give you a real-life example of what I'm preaching here to you this morning. So they tell me this may be a pre-existing thing with your brain, blah, 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 blah. But guess what? I was able to tap into a memorial that my mother had set up some years back. See, I, I had the crisis. I had the news. They, they told me, and I'm still waiting on the results from the MRI. I haven't heard anything back, so I'm still in this, still believing in faith. But when the doctor told me that, I was able to tap into a testimony. Some of you know my story. When I was, my mother was pregnant with me, they told her to abort me. 
The doctor did some tests. He could see my heartbeat was irregular. That, that was something else the doctor just told me. He, he could see my heartbeat was irregular. Things were messing up with my brain. And he told my mother, he said, this child is going to be disabled. You need to abort this baby, uh, Mrs. Castrillion, and save yourself the headache. How many know that's enough to knock down a young lady when they're being told that? And she's eight, eight and a half months pregnant with me. They said, go ahead and save yourself the trouble. Go ahead and abort this baby. And at that time, my mother was a worship leader at her parents' church, and the song was really popular, Whose Report Shall You Believe? We Shall Believe the Report of the Lord. And so she began to declare that over my life. Whose report are we going to? We're going to believe the report of the Lord. And listen to how the devil works. Then the doctor tells her, well, you won't notice any abnormalities till he's almost two years old. So then it was this whole faith walk for, you know, the first couple years of my life. But I was told that I wasn't supposed to talk. I was told I wasn't supposed to be able to walk. Yet here I stand preaching the Word of God this morning. So see, I tap into that testimony, and I say, if God was able to make me be born normal, then my God is going to take care of whatever's going on with my brain. Somebody give glory to God this morning. Folks, this is real life. We serve a supernatural God. I've seen it again and again. We just had a worship night on Friday night at our church where Joseph was there. He was playing the drums. His brother, Benny, was leading worship. And they told his brother, Ben, they said, your, your wife's never going to be able to have children. And there she is. She's pregnant. They're having the baby shower next, next week. So you don't have to be subjected to the laws of the land. You don't have to be subjected to the terms of this world. If you walk in authority, amen, you have to be unshakable. It doesn't matter what comes your way. If you're walking in right standing with God, you should be unshakable because the creator of the universe is on your side. Amen? amen. Acts 28, 1 through 6, it says, Now when they had, they had escaped, then they found out that the island was called Malta. This is the Apostle Paul. It says, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because it was cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle, a bundle of sticks together and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat. Now remember that, because of the heat. I'm going to go back to that. And fastened on to his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Somebody say, shake it, off. shake it off. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long while, they saw no harm come to him, and they changed their minds and said he was a god. Wow. Now, two things I want you to see there. Number one, when you're going through difficulty and you're going through hardship and you're doing the work of the Lord, people are going to talk. They start talking amongst themselves and they say, surely this man's a murderer. Look at that viper that just grabbed on his hand. You can't worry about what people say. Because the very people that are around you in your inner circle are the very ones that sometimes are going to kick you in. They're going to they're gonna come up with assumptions about why this is happening. Look, that's got to be because of this and this. Blah, blah, blah. If you worry about everything that people say, you're not going to get very far in life. You got to shake it off. Somebody say, shake it off. <laughs> Just shake it off and keep going. Don't worry about it. And the second thing I want you to see here is the Bible says, what was the Apostle Paul doing when the, when the viper came out and bit his hand? I just read it. What was he doing? He was throwing sticks on the fire, right? He was, don't, somebody's got to grab a hold of this revelation this morning. He was throwing sticks on the fire, which increased the heat, which caused the enemy to come out and attack. Are you hearing me today? See, we have it mixed up because we think that the devil is attacking us with the upper hand. We think that we're the ones that have the disadvantage, and he is attacking us with the upper hand. When the reality is, if you are doing the work of God, and you are living the way that you're supposed to live. If the devil is attacking you, he's attacking you because, because the heat is getting turned up. Because what you're doing is causing him to get uncomfortable. Therefore, he's coming out and he's striking defensively. It's a defensive attack. It's not an offensive attack. You have the upper hand. Why? Because of who's living inside of you. Don't be afraid of the little viper. 
He's just starting to feel the heat now. That's why he's coming out and striking you. But what would have happened if the apostle Paul said, oh, a viper? God could have got me through anything, but a viper's venomous. What am I going to do now? No, oh, man, shake it off. Just shake it off, whatever it is. The doctor's report, your brain, shake it off. I'm not worried about it. I'm telling you, that night when I got home, I didn't lose one bit of sleep. I went right to sleep. Why? Because I'm not worried about it. I'm unshakable. You hear me this morning. Doesn't mean I don't have doubts. Doesn't mean I don't have fears. We're human beings. We all have those things. But we have to be able to go back to the Word of God and go back to the power of our testimony. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We have to remember what God has brought us through. See, it's the Word of God. It's the blood of the Lamb, but it's also the word of our testimony. There's so much power in testimony because we're able to see what God has brought us through. The countless times I should have been dead. Some of you know that I grew up on the mission field as a missionary kid. I saw some crazy things. I've had guns pointed at me. I've had a knife put this long put to my stomach before. I could have been dead back then, but if I didn't die back then, then I have to believe that God has something for me to do, and he's going to sustain this body. We were driving one time over a, a, a road that had been taken over by the river because the hurricane had come through. And the natives came out of the bushes. They came out of everywhere. And with the pressure of the water, they started pushing our vehicle. We were getting ready to fall down into a ravine and die. And we just started praying. Some of us were praying. My mother was screaming. <laughs> Jesus! I guess she was praying because she was calling out to Jesus. But I mean, literally, we're in an SUV, the water's pushing up again, so we're going slowly over the river. There's a ravine on this side. It was the only way in and out of the village. We were on our way to bring fresh drinking water to them. And so we're on our way there. All of a sudden, they come out of nowhere because they didn't want the Word of God there because it was a town given over completely to witchcraft. The witch doctors ruled that town, very heavy with voodoo and all kinds of other witchcraft. And so we're going in there bringing purified water to them to drink, and they didn't want us there. They didn't want the Word of God. When they thought we were just visiting, everything was hunky-dory. They rolled out the red car, but as soon as they found out we were there to stay and plant a church, different story. And so they're pushing the vehicle, and it's going with the pressure of the water. It's going, man. Water's powerful. And so we're crying out, God, Jesus, help us. All of a sudden, the, the, the mayor of the town pulls up behind us, and his bodyguards get out and start shooting rounds up in the air, and then everybody took off running because they were scared. How many know the angel of the Lord sent those bodyguards out there with guns to save us? So I'm telling you, folks, I've seen the hand of God. I could literally, people have told me you need to write a book, and I may just do that one day. I don't have time for that right now, but I may just do that one day. But I could stay here all day long giving you testimonies of the supernatural power of God. We have to be unshakable. But can I tell you something this morning? We cannot be unshakable if there's compromise in our life. And that's my third point this morning. My third point is no compromise. No compromise. See, I'm up here preaching. It sounds real good. And we're saying, amen, glory, hallelujah. But I'm not one of those preachers that just preaches victory, victory, victory. And then I say, okay, go out this week and live however you want to live. If I'm going to preach the gospel, I'm going to preach the whole gospel, amen? You don't, get, you don't get the victory. You don't get the power. You don't get the authority. You don't get the peace. You don't get any of it if there's compromise in your life. You've got to be in right standing with God. If you want to have this kind of assurance, see, so many people are ridden with anxiety because they don't know where they stand with God. So many people are worried and losing sleep at night and they can't concentrate and they can't focus and their mind is all over the place because you know you're not living the way God wants you to live. The only way that you can walk in a power and in an authority and in confidence is by knowing there's nothing in my life that is displeasing to God. Now that doesn't mean that we don't mess up. That doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Lord knows I make a lot of mistakes. I was getting ready to make a mistake here this morning because I was frustrated about something. I was going to speak out of turn. I had to turn around and say, God, help me bite my tongue. Help me bite my tongue. And see, that's what the enemy will do. He'll try and do little annoyances right before you come into the sanctuary to bother you so that you get off track. And I'm not going to allow him to do that. But we all make mistakes. So you hear me? We're not perfect. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm living in alignment with the will of God for my life. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I don't have a secret hidden life on the side that nobody knows about that I want to keep covered up. 
And that's why I can have authority to preach the word of God. And that's why when calamity strikes and catastrophe hits and everything's going wrong and everything's turned upside down, I don't have to worry about it. Why? Because there's no compromise in my life. And when we preach about compromise, we think about, you know, blatant sins like sexual immorality and thievery and lying and deception. Can I tell you that compromise could be just doing something that God has called you to do on your own terms rather than on his? Compromise could be as simple as something as God gave you a ministry to do and you want to do it on your own terms and you aren't willing to submit to authority and submit to the vision of God. How about Jonah in the Bible? We all remember the story of Jonah, right? God speaks to Jonah and says, you need to go to Nineveh and preach to these, these people over there. They're heathens, they're evil people, they need the word of God. Go over there and preach the word. What does Jonah do? He gets on a boat and goes the opposite way. He's like, I'm out of here, I'm not going to those wicked people. Now let me ask you a question. In that moment, did that make Jonah any less a preacher of the word of God? Did it make him any less a child of God at that time? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. But regardless, he was compromising, see? Because he wanted to do things on his own terms, on his own plan. And so we know the story. The Bible says that he was sleeping in the ship and the water starts raging. The waves are crashing. The wind is blowing. Everything's going hectic. And the guys that are with him are saying, what's going on? What's happening? And they're like looking amongst themselves, Where, where's the issue here? What's the problem here? And then Jonah's down there sleeping in the, in the belly of the ship. And so he said, get that guy up here. What's your deal, man? And he says, I serve, I, no, he says, I fear the God of Israel. I fear the God of Israel. And see, you may be all, so off track right now, but if you still fear the God of Israel, there's still hope for you. There's still hope for you. You may be living in compromise right now. There are multiple phases of compromise. I've gone all the way like Jonah did, man. I'm telling you, I'm preaching from experience. I've been on the opposite end because I told God, I know I'm called to preach the word of God, but I, that's not what I, I want to do. I told God, I'm going to be a businessman. I'm going to fund the kingdom of God. And God has anointed me to be a businessman and be entrepreneurial. But, you know, I wanted to do it on my own terms, I said, God, I'm going to be a businessman. I'm not preaching the word of God because that's not what I'm anointed to do. I'm an anointed to make money. I'm going to give money to the kingdom of God, and that's that. And I lived in a constant state of compromise for years until I ended up like Jonah in the belly of the whale. But you may be here this morning, and you may be faced with the decision, do I take the ship? Do I go, or do I go to Nineveh? Don't go to the ship. Go to Nineveh, whatever God's calling you to do. But maybe you've already gotten on the ship, and now you're in the storm. You've compromised, you're out in the middle of the ocean, you feel like you're too far gone. Let me tell you something, you have to say no to compromise now, wherever you are. And so the Bible says that Jonah tells them, there's only one way we're going to get out of this, throw me overboard. And music team, I'm closing, you guys can come back up. Throw me overboard. No compromise there. See, he could have said, let's keep trying, guys, let's keep trying to row, let's keep trying to make this happen, you know. But no, he said, no compromise. The only way that this is going to happen is if you throw me overboard. And they said, no, we can't throw you overboard. We'll be guilty of the blood of an innocent man will be on our hands. Keep rowing harder. The harder they row, the higher the waves got, the harder the wind got. You've got to say no to compromise now. And it may be uncomfortable because you may be in a position where you've gone your own way for so long now that it's uncomfortable to say no and get thrown into the cold ocean. But the Bible says, he said, throw me overboard. He gets thrown overboard, and a, and a fish comes out and swallows him. Now think about that for a moment. You may be at that phase. You may be inside the belly of the fish. It's cold. It's wet. It's slimy. It probably doesn't smell very good. How many of you have ever been down to the National Harbor or the Inner Harbor, right there by the water? It doesn't smell very good, does it? That may be where you are this morning, but let me read to you Jonah's prayer. There's still hope today. Look with me at Jonah 2, 10, 2, 1 through 10. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Oh, my goodness, the presence of God is in this place this morning. Whew. I'm telling you, I feel the presence of God right here, right now to redeem some people. There's still hope for you, regardless of what you're going through, man. Something, something along the way 
in life knocked you down in the race. I don't know what it is. I don't know what happened. I don't know when it happened. But something along the way knocked you down, and the devil has wanted to keep you down. But this morning, the power of God is in this place to pick you back up and set you right where you need to be. Let's read this. It says, And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried out, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep. You guys can go ahead and start playing. I want you to play Do It Again, if you would, for the altar song. That was so powerful. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and all your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with all its bars closed behind me. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. I don't know where you are this morning, but God can bring you up out of the pit. Oh, Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered. Oh, somebody say remember. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Got to get serious with God. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah to dry land. Now, I'm going to say this as bluntly as I possibly can because it's right there in the Scripture. Wherever you are today, God can cause the fish to vomit you out where you need to be. Oh, hear me this morning. He can cause you to make up lost ground. You may think, man, so many years I've been compromising. I've been out of the will of God. If you would just say no to compromise and humble yourself this morning, He can cause that fish to spin you out right onto the track wherever you need to be. And then He can use your mistake for His glory. Because there's another passage there that talks about what happened with the men that were on the ship with Jonah. The Bible says that after they cast him out, they cried out to God because they acknowledged Him as the one true God. And they made a vow with Him that day. Now, how many know those men on the ship with Jonah, their lives were forever changed? But if Jonah had never made the mistake, God would have never done what he did, and they would have never had the knowledge of the power of God. So even though it wasn't the original plan that God intended for Jonah to get derailed and be disobedient, wherever you are, God can turn it for good. All you have to be willing to do is surrender yourself and say no to compromise. Amen? So let's recap this morning what we've learned today. Have you been blessed so far today? Amen. I've been blessed. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm leaving here encouraged. Number one, we have to remember, if we're going to get back up in this, we have to remember everything that God has brought us through. I know I'm being faced with a mountain right now, God, but you've moved mountains before, just like the song says. I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. Hallelujah. Number two, number two, we have to be unshakable. Unshakable. Regardless of what comes our way, we can't let it shake us. We have to shake it. We have to shake our situations. So somebody say, shake it off. Shake it off. Oh, come on, say it louder. Say, shake it off. Number three, no compromise. No compromise. We have to say no. Regardless of where you are today, it's not too late to say no. Just say no. From this day forward, I'm going to serve God. Why? Because I want to walk in His plan. I don't want to be in the, in the belly of this fish anymore. It's too smelly in here. So what happens when you put all that together? What does it say? Come on, show the next slide. What does it say? It's time to run. Stand on your feet this morning. Now, at the beginning of, at the, beginning of the sermon, I showed you a video with some folks that weren't doing too well running, right? I want to show you a video this morning of what your run is supposed to look like. So go ahead and direct your, your attention to the screens. Let's show that video. Look at the guy on the left here. Look at him. You see him on the left? He's just running through all the obstacles. That's what your spiritual run needs to look like. No matter what life hands you, when you get knocked down, get back up and run. Amen? Hallelujah. Are you going to run today? Are you going to run today? I know I'm running. Regardless of what might happen today, hallelujah.
If you receive something today, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask our altar workers to come at this time. We're going to open up the altars here in a few minutes. And if you need prayer for anything, you can come and receive that prayer today. I want to remind those of you who are here with us for the very first time about that connection card. Bring it to the atrium, the info center. They have a special gift for you there. But I want to make sure that we do due diligence today. And if you've never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment, we're going to ask you to consider him today. Because if you've never received him, you're not living yet. You're just existing. And there's a race that you too are called to run. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes today. And if you're here today and you have never given your heart to the Lord, you do not have a personal relationship with God. Or maybe today you say, I gave my heart to the Lord at one time, but I know I'm not living right. I'm compromising. And today you want to get it right. I'm going to ask you right across this worship center, if you need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life today, just lift your hand right where you are. Just lift your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you so much in the balcony today. If you need the Lord Jesus, just lift your hand up. Thank you today. Let's all pray this prayer after me. Father God, I thank you for loving me. I ask you to forgive me for all my sin. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. I say yes to a relationship with you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family of God. Amen. We want to encourage you to come down and have somebody pray with you. We really are so grateful that you made that decision today. For those of you who have to leave, we'll allow you to do that. But if you need prayer, we invite you to come and receive that prayer. Everybody, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I am saved. I am healed. I am free. I have victory. I have authority, and I'm running the race in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Well, we hope you've enjoyed watching today. We trust that God has ministered to you. We're praying that God will touch you and bless you and strengthen you and that he would have taken the word today that you've listened to and imparted it into your life in a very special way. Take time to look at our website and see the other things we have to offer, our upcoming events, other ministries that we're involved in, and also the time of our services. If you're ever in Silver Spring area, we invite you to come to a live service, and you will never be the same. Once again, thanks for viewing. May God richly bless you. Mm -hmm.